Good morning. Uh, nice to be with you. My name is Stuart Taylor. This panel is titled, What is Congress Doing to Reassert Its Power Over Agencies? We have three terrific panelists. There they are. And, uh, and I'm going to introduce them about 30 seconds each, and then they'll go in the same order in which I introduced them. First will come David McIntosh, uh, who's going to have to leave early, I might note. Uh, and he'll go first. He's long a leading advocate of limited constitutional government and limiting regulation. Uh, he's the president of the Club for Growth and vice chairman of the Federalist Society, which he co-founded. David served in the Reagan and the first Bush administrations and from 1995 to 2001 in the House of Representatives from Indiana's second congressional district. He's been active with free market and conservative organizations and was a partner with Mayor Brown, LLP, in Washington. David Vladek will go next. He is the A.B. Chettle Chair in Civil Procedure at the Georgetown University Law Center, where his many roles have also included co-director of the Institute for Public Representation, leading its work in civil rights. He was director of the Bureau of Consumer Protection of the Federal Trade Commission from 2009 to 2012, and he's been a leading advocate of regulation to protect online privacy, among other things. Earlier in his career, David spent 30 years as a lawyer with the Public Citizen Litigation Group, including 10 years as its director. Todd Gaziano, to my far left, is executive director of and a senior fellow in constitutional law for the Pacific Legal Foundation's DC Center. He served in all three branches of the federal government, in the private sector, and in nonprofit foundations. Todd helped then Representative David McIntosh craft the Congressional Review Act in 1996. His ideas on how to use it have repeatedly run recognition in the Wall Street Journal and elsewhere. Uh, we're a little behind schedule, but uh, we hope we'll catch up. And so with that, uh, please hear David McIntosh first. Thank you, Stuart. It's great to be with you and today and David and Todd. And, and I apologize for having to leave. Uh, something's come up that's unavoidable. Um, I am very proud of what Todd and I did when I was in Congress with the Congressional Review Act. It took 20 years for it to become really useful, but it has been uh, this spring in the Senate and the House. But let me step back and, and frame what I think is the real question here, and, and it was presented in part by Senator Lee in his speech. Um, what, what should Congress be doing to reassert itself in the legislative process that's being engaged in by the regulatory agencies. The flip side of that is what Congress should not be doing in interfering with the president on exercises of legitimate executive authority under Article II. Um, so the regulatory context is the one where we see the greatest delegation of legislative authority has a huge impact on the economy, um, approximately $2 trillion today. Mercatus Center study revealed that since 1980, uh, it's cost us about 1% in GDP growth in our economy, a total of about $4 trillion had we had um, less costly, more reasonable regulations. So the impact of this incorrect delegation of legislative authority to the, exec to the agencies has a huge impact of, with the bad policy on our economy. The Congressional Review Act, which we put in in 1995, was part of the contract with America. Speaker Gingrich asked me as a new freshman to write something that would address the overreach of regulatory agencies. And the way that Todd helped us craft it was in response to the 1983 Chadha decision that said you can't have a single house veto of legislation. You have to pass a bill by both houses and have it presented to the president and signed into law or uh, enter into law without his signature after the elapse of a certain requisite number of days. The goal of the Congressional Review Act was to reassert congressional authority over the regulatory process as a requirement that the agencies present all of their regulations and guidance documents that are defined as regulations covered under uh, the Congressional Review Act to Congress. 
that they are able to lay there for 60 legislative days. Perhaps most importantly is the fact that it created expedited procedures, both in the House and the Senate. Uh, the key one we focus on today is the 50 vote requirement in the Senate, um, but there are also other procedures for bringing bills forward in the House uh, where a small group of members can, can really require a vote on whether or not that regulation should be overturned. Um, the 15 of the bills have made it to Congress this year. The, the time's now elapsed for most of the congressional uh, or the leg regulations that the Obama administration put into place. But the law is still very much an important factor for Congress reviewing regulations coming from this administration. And as Todd will explain in his um, discussion, the, the potential of reaching back uh, still is there if the agencies have failed to follow uh, the proper requirements. It also has a big impact on setting the policy because one of the requirements is if Congress disapproves a regulation, then the agencies can't go back and essentially repromulgate the same regulation over again. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing what this administration does on the executive side. Um, the use of guidance documents become very much a popular choice by the agencies. That further um, avoids the accountability because you don't have to go through notice and comment rulemaking and it doesn't go before Congress with a vote that's recorded and people can see who's responsible. Um, that review of those guidance documents, if they weren't sent to Congress, can still occur there. But frankly, OMB, and, and I understand uh, Mick Mulvaney is going to be here later, and the OIRA process should assert itself in, in looking at these agency guidance documents and reviewing them and replacing them in the Trump administration. Uh, I really appreciated Senator Lee's discussion of the three legislative uh, article uh, points that could be done by Congress to change the process, to get it back closer to a constitutional allocation of legislative authority and executive authority. Um, two things I would point out is the RAINS Act is essentially the Congressional Review Act with the reversal of the presumption of going forward. Um, under Congressional Review Act, if you do nothing, the rule becomes effective as a legal requirement on the public. Under the RAINS Act, if Congress does nothing, then the rule does not go forward and is not, uh, have to affirmatively act before it can be uh, forced as something, a force of law that Americans have to follow in their daily lives. Um, second thing that I would urge Congress to do is uh, apply the principle of separation of powers, and, and Senator Lee touched on this, in um, the executive branch as they're engaging in this regulatory process. Uh, Will Hahn, who's here today, and I wrote an article uh, at the beginning of this um, uh, uh, Article One project for the Federalist Society, pointing out that if you do that and separate um, the rulemaking from the enforcement from the adjudication functions in these agencies, you can once again have the protections that the founders put in the Constitution for the government writ large applied to effectively this portion of policy making in the government. Um, I, I want to mention a couple things that Congress can do using its oversight authority and then segue from that to one thing I think they shouldn't be doing. Um, I, I think it's very good that Congress review how government agencies spend the money that they appropriate. I understand the House oversight is looking at um, a lot of issues on how the government uses fines that they collect, uh, both criminal and civil. Um, apparently many of those don't get redirected back into the budget and are applied by the agency in pursuing its policy goals. Um, the Justice Department apparently about 15% of its budget comes from this. Well Congress needs to reassert its power of the purse in being able to direct these agencies how they spend monies that come into the um, Treasury. The Energy and Commerce Oversight Committee is looking into waste, fraud, and abuse about the Medicaid personnel care services. Again, I think it's more than appropriate, it's necessary for Congress to be vigorous and assertive in its oversight function on how government funds are actually being spent. 
What's not appropriate mm -hmm. is for Congress to try to direct the executive branch or the president in the execution of Article II powers. And today, coming in on the drive, I heard an example of that as Senator McCain is criticizing President Trump for directing the FBI director on an investigation. I think it's important for us to step back and remember the president has the power and the authority in the Constitution to enforce the laws. There's nothing written in the Constitution about an FBI director or an independent investigatory agency. So, in fact, if anybody could give Director Comey direction, it's President Trump. Um, presidents in the past have adopted a policy that makes sense of insulating the FBI from other political direction. Uh, but nonetheless, the FBI reports to him. It's his decision about that they're, they've been delegated about who to investigate and how to pursue in uh, law enforcement activities. That's one of the things that I think it's important for us to remember as we look at this question of Congress reasserting its powers under Article I. Do that, don't do the politically convenient activity of interfering with the President on his exercise of Article II powers. Let me close by saying I'm, I'm delighted with the conference today. I'm really proud of what the Federalist Society staff has done to put this together. And I think it's one of the most important issues that face us uh, in the, this generation in correcting the right administration of government in the Article I and Article II. Thank you. Um, thank you, Stuart, for coming and moderating. Thank you, guys. And I apologize. I can't stick around for the rest of the panel. I planned to originally and would have loved to, but I'm going to run. Take care. Uh, good morning. Um, let me just start out by thanking the organizers of this conference. Uh, I like being invited to Federalist Society conferences. I think this is a haven where civil discussion takes place. And uh, there will be a fair amount, I think, of civil back and forth between Todd and myself. Um, let, let's start out with the sort of the question of the day, which is how should Congress reassert itself in terms of uh, running the government, administering the government? And one statute that Todd, I'm sure, is going to talk about, because Todd and David are two of the many parents of the Congressional Review Act, is the fate of the Congressional Review Act. Now, David pointed out that the clock has essentially run out on the Obama administration's regulations. Now, there have been, I think it's 13 rules that have been repealed by Congress. A fourth was, a 14th was not the methane rule. Uh, let me simply say this. I worked on CHOD and I worked on the legislative veto cases, and I think the CRA is a good substitute for the legislative veto. That process, and I, and I think uh, Senator Lee was a little elliptical about this, that process was plainly unconstitutional. It gave Congress the right to essentially engage in lawmaking without going through the presentment clause and the bicameralism provisions of the Constitution. The Supreme Court had no trouble setting it aside. And the CRA was designed to provide a constitutionally based substitute for the legislative veto. Now, it's finally reached its 21st birthday. Uh, it can now drink. Um, and so uh, we have seen, I think, the first real use of the CRA. Now, it's a little awkward that I'm going to explain why Todd is wrong before Todd has laid out his argument. But Todd has taken the position that under the CRA, Congress can nonetheless reach back and essentially repeal through the CRA process any rule that was not submitted to Congress within the formal constraints of the Congressional Review Act. And, and I just think that interpretation of the act, and although Todd wrote it, is nonetheless dead wrong. Uh, first is, there's, there's, no, there's no limiting principle to this argument. It, it, it would apply to rules issued during the Clinton administration, the Bush administration, probably the, the Truman administration, any administration that postdates the, uh, the APA. Second, I think it's atextual. Um, if you look at Section 802A, it limits the procedures of the CRA to rules submitted under Section 801A1, which specifies that the rule has to be submitted before taking effect. 
right? Nothing in the statute deals with rules that have not been submitted except for one provision that allows rules that have taken, been, had taken effect nonetheless to be disapproved by Congress. So here's the problem. This, this argument has no limiting a, a principle. Um, it seems not to be supported by the text of the statute. And the way the text was supposed to, uh, the, the statute is supposed to operate is the enforcer. That is, the, the entity responsible for processing agency submissions is the GAO. The GAO is not an organ of the executive branch. It is part of Congress. And Congress has long acquiesced in, the, in rules taking effect that have not been submitted uh, to Congress through the formal means prescribed by the CRA. So if there's a culprit here, it is Congress, not the agencies. But in any event, the bottom line is this wonderful sort of highly academic technical discussion between Todd and myself really is beside the point. The Congressional Review Act is a political statute. When it was drafted, Todd had the foresight and wisdom um, to uh, insert in Section 805 an absolute prohibition on judicial review. Congress may do with the Congressional Review Act as it sees fit. Prior to the Congressional Review Act, Congress always had the authority and retains the authority to overrule any regulation it does not like simply by passing a disapproval resolution in both houses of Congress, presenting it to the president. So Todd and I are gonna waste a lot of time discussing this theory, but in, in my view, it doesn't essentially matter if, the, if Congress and the president agree that a regulation issued by an agency anytime tomorrow or from the beginning of the administrative state, Congress and the president are free to nullify that rule. So it's a fascinating debate. Um, I think it's one addressed to the political branch. The courts have uh, been uniform that issues raised under the Congressional Review Act are not suitable for judicial review. And so uh, it's a wonderful debate. Todd and I will continue to have it, but I think it's beside the point. The other way Congress ought to exercise its authority is by speaking out against the regulatory review executive order that this president has issued. You know, I wonder, you know, I'm looking at a room full of very able lawyers and I'm wondering where the hell are you guys? Um, because the executive order on regulation that has been uh, uh, issued by President Trump is, uh, is simply a, the most uh, sort of aggressive effort to accrete power to the executive branch that I've ever seen. I was here when Ronald Reagan became president and just to be clear, I was not a fan of Ronald Reagan, but I admired very much his handiwork when he took office. Within a month of taking office, Ronald Reagan issued the first executive order on regulatory review, which in my view has been the most consequential act in administrative law since the effective date of the Administrative Procedure Act. That executive order was very carefully thought through and was supported by an extremely detailed opinion from the Office of Legal Counsel explaining why it was constitutional. Now I thought OLC was wrong, uh, it turns out I lost in the courts, um, but it was a bold, aggressive, carefully written uh, assertion of executive power over the agencies. Now, if you look at Trump's executive order, it is not going to stand the test of time. The lawyers who are defending this executive order are going to have to engage in the farce that the lawyers engaged in defending the sanctuary city executive order had to do, which is to tell a court, imagine you're a lawyer defending an act of a president, to tell the court that it has no meaning. All it is is it is an effort to use the bully pulpit, that the executive order itself, even though it insists that federal funding will be cut off to states uh, and municipalities that, that, that act as sanctuary cities, it didn't really mean what it says. 
Well, the Trump executive order on regulatory review is of the same volition. It does not take into account Congress's direction to agencies to take regulatory action when certain conditions are met. And in fact, the guidance that's been issued to agencies to interpret it makes it quite plain that it bars agencies from fulfilling the very missions assigned to them by the president. Um, if you care about congressional power, you cannot think well of the president's executive order on regulatory review. Let me quickly sort of comment on the other three legislative initiatives that Senator Lee talked about. First, I, I'm going to take them in reverse order because I think there's a huge misunderstanding about what agencies may do with fines and civil penalties. The general rule is all fines and civil penalties collected by agencies goes immediately to the federal treasury. It goes to the general fund. Stop. To the extent there are agencies that are allowed to retain penalties and, and, and civil, uh, civil fines, those statutes designate exactly where that money is to go to, by and large. That is, Congress, for example, funds the Department of Justice's Consumer Protection Litigation Unit, which generally goes after pharmaceutical companies who cheat the government by allowing the, federal, by allowing the uh, department to retain funds dedicated to funding those positions. So every time there is a statute that allows the agency to retain funding, and at the FTC, we had no such luck. Every penny we collected went straight to the federal treasury. That is a decision that Congress made, deliberated, and voted on. It's, in, it's embedded in legislation. In terms of overruling Chevron, I, I, who cares? I mean, you know, the idea that Chevron changed administrative law comes as a shock to people who litigated administrative law questions before Chevron. Um, by and large, courts look to see what expert agencies thought because oftentimes the questions that were presented were beyond the ability of federal judges necessarily to, to, uh, to decide on their own. And Chevron is the perfect case. Chevron was a three strikes and you're out for the, <coughs> for the DC circuit. Three panels of the DC circuit had gotten the wrong answer each time. Finally, when the case went up to the Supreme Court for the third, this has been the third iteration of the Court of Appeals, the court basically said, look, you guys have screwed this up twice. Just at least take a listen to what the agency had to say. And with respect to the Reins Act, I think this, you know, if I were Todd, I would be unhappy with the Reins Act. Because what the Reins Act intends to do is to render the Congressional Review Act a dead letter. Um, and, uh, you know, there's an old proverb about be careful what you wish for. Uh, Congress better be careful what it wishes for in the Reins Act. Congress, in my view, does not have the institutional strength or competence essentially to go back and to look at every significant rule that agencies promulgate. I think as a matter of institutional design, the CRA is a better tool for Congress when an agency oversteps its bounds or adopts a rule like the ergonomics rule, which was the first rule that was set aside under the Congressional Review Act. That's the better way for Congress to exercise that control. And let me just end by saying one last thing, which is even though up until now the CRA had only been used once, I don't think that really explains the significance of the statute. The statute had, I think, very much a moderating effect on what agencies did. Agencies knew that there was a process in place for Congress to carefully scrutinize any rule, any significant rule certainly, that it issued. There have been many disapproval resolutions that have been offered to Congress. Congress has thought about these rules by and large until recently. It hasn't disapproved them. But if I had my choice between the RAINS Act and the CRA, the CRA is a responsible, is a responsible sort of uh, reaction to, ch uh, to, uh, to Chada and the demise of the legislative veto. The RAINS Act, I think, for one thing, Congress would actually have to come to town and do a lot of work. And Congress's inclination to do that, notwithstanding what Senator Lee had said earlier this morning, 
uh, I think is a hydraulic pressure against the, uh, against the enactment of the RAINS Act. Anyway, I think my time is up. Thank you very much. Naturally, I want to thank the society of which I've been a very proud uh, member and, and officer in the practice group. It's a great honor when they, they ask me to speak. And uh, of course, uh, I'm sorry David couldn't hear this, but it's great uh, to have the honor to work with him 21 years ago and again today to support the full implementation of the Congressional Review Act. And as for uh, David Vladek, he is a great and honorable um, uh, advocate, and I'm, I'm pleased to correct him on many, many of his mistakes. Um, uh, I, I will mention that uh, I, I, um, I can't resist talking about a few of the laws but I'm, uh, that uh, bills that Senator Lee mentioned this morning. I was going to skip them uh, completely since he did that and concentrate mo mostly on the Congressional Review Act. But as for the RAINS Act, the criticism, uh, I would love this Congressional Review Act to be supplanted as to major rules. And in fact, when uh, I was helping David draft the law, we drafted it in a way so that that could be possible. We, I'm, I don't have perfect foresight in most things, but we actually had that in mind. But as to the argument that Congress doesn't have institutional competence to review a rule, you don't need the same level of confidence to figure out exactly what rule to promulgate, but if you can't review the rulemaking record, you can't have witnesses, you can't evaluate on a yes or no basis, then God help us, Congress ought to get that competence. It is a constitutional crisis if Congress thinks it doesn't have the constitutional or other institutional competence to pass on a major rule. Okay, now to the Congressional Review Act. Um, most of what I'm going to cover, those other bills I love, I love, I love, but I'm not sure that they're going to get past the Senate filibuster anytime soon. Another improvement to the Congressional Review Act that hasn't been mentioned is the Midnight Rules Relief Act, which would improve it even short of the RAINS Act. But this is the law we have. It's my hammer, so I'm going to try to, I think we can kill a lot of things with it. And uh, we have a coalition website that we're relaunching today, redtaperollback.com. It's got a lot of scholarly reports that I may uh, reference, one by Paul Larkin that I'm going to especially mention, um, and it, Club for Growth Heritage and a lot of other people, CEI, are, are partners with it. But we're relaunching it today with a lot of other fancy, fancy gizmos, so go there. Um, uh, I also have 75 copies of a three-pager that'll summarize some of what I'm I'm going to I'll pass out a few if you want them or put them at the press table later. Okay, so now uh, why David is mistaken about several things. The first sentence of the CRA is an intentionally powerful uh, fulcrum and powerhouse of the CRA. It provides, quote, before a rule can take effect... The federal agency promulgating such rule, and then I'm summarizing, shall send a report with a copy of the rule to Congress. This is sep and, and uh, every other provision of the act is essentially keyed uh, to that. In Section 802, the congressional um, uh, expedited procedures are queued to the later of two dates. Publication, if publication is required. So publication isn't required in the CRA, only if it otherwise is. But publication, publication, and submission to Congress. There are a lot of reasons we explain why uh, submission is a non-de minimis, non-harmless uh, error. And the main one is, is that it's the, con the consequence for non-delivery is that the rule, except for special emergency cases, can't go into effect. GAO has begged and begged and begged OMB to submit the rules, but they are not the enforcer. Congress in the plain text of the statute made the agencies the enforcer and the consequence for non-delivery is two. One that I'm gonna stress here to all you litigators is that the rule cannot go into effect. Um, so apart from what the administration and Congress can do to fully enforce the Congressional Review Act, you all can sue, sue, sue. And David is right that the, there is a judicial review bar on congressional procedures and on OMB's major rule requirements that corresponds with other parts of the APA that don't apply to the executive branch. But there is a split in the lower courts as to whether 
private parties can assert the non-effectiveness of a rule. And I am convinced that the right answer, the one that the Supreme Court would ultimately reach, is that there is judicial review in a defensive use, especially if you bring a due process clause. And here I'm going to commend Paul Larkin's paper. He's written two brilliant papers on the CRA recently, but the one on judicial review explains why there is or will be judicial review for rules that aren't submitted to Congress. Now, I'm hoping the administration clears this up so that you don't need to litigate on behalf of your, your um, clients, but until then, please sue. Now, back to one other point that David um, said in the press, I hope that he has learned his mistake since then, is that rules under the CRA are very broadly defined, intentionally so, and explained in the legislative history to include almost every guidance document, almost every policy manual, almost every enforcement manual, and for the obvious reason that the authors of the law knew that the agencies were uh, ignoring notice and comment procedures and they wanted the ability, they wanted A, to create a slight disincentive for that, but also the ability to review those very important uh, policy manuals and guidance documents and for Congress, quite frankly, to have a record of them. Um, so with that, I will now turn to why what we call CRA 2.0 is, is appropriate so that if the president delivers any rule and David was mistaken that they can go all the way back to the APA 1946, but they can go back to March um, 1996, which is the passage of the act. Um, and of course, the political check will suggest that if there's been great reliance on a rule, it should just be submitted so that it can go into effect that very few of the older rules will actually be sent up with a, a request to, to be disapproved. But certainly any rule from 19, March 1996 to the present, and there's, that's a perfectly uh, legitimate limiting principle, uh, David. Um, there are four ways that you get to the conclusion that the expedited procedures have not expired before they begin. They're trick, the expedited procedures are only begin on delivery to Congress, and it's the, the again, the later of, of publication and submission to Congress that triggers those. Um, one of the other uh, uh, brilliant proofs of this, that uh, of the four that I hadn't thought about, but again, that Paul Larkin in one of his papers noted, was that there's no statute of limitation that an agency can um, get beyond by refusing to submit a rule to Congress, wrongfully denying Congress, the, the ability to use the expedited procedures. Um, but that's what I, uh, Congress actually reviewing older rules is what I call CRA 3.0, but what the administration can do really is more powerful, and I expect the administration um, has had many good reasons not to uh, implement this yet. Uh, there's not an OIRA head. Um, they were concentrating on the rules that were actually delivered at the end of the Obama administration, but the, the administration should more f should recognize the um, what the law requires and implement this on their own. And this is how I think it should do it. OMB should direct the agencies to conduct an orderly review of all the rules and guidance documents that weren't submitted, and then consult with OMB about the next step. And this is one of the reasons. They don't want to waste Congress's time reviewing an old rule that the administration might withdraw or modify. But anyway, after that consultation, the agencies would have about four options. One, of course, is to deliver the rule to Congress so that it can go into effect. But remember, that's only prospectively into effect. Regardless of what they do about a rule not submitted, it was not in effect until it was submitted to Congress. So there should also be an internal review of enforcement actions on a, that relied on a rule that was not lawfully in effect, but thought to be so. Now, in many cases, the enforcement action can still be maintained under the statute, under other regulations. Um, they'll tell the court, never mind, our, our illegal reliance on that regulation doesn't matter. But in a few cases, and I can think of some that we at the Pacific Legal Foundation are litigating, it'll probably um, make the difference. Anyway, second option to the agencies. Uh, they can issue a uh, declaration that they're reconsidering the rule. But this is just a stopgap. It'll eventually turn into one of those, they'll have to take one of these other options. But the courts will give 
um, the administration at this time uh, some uh, leeway if it is identifying particular rules that it is reconsidering. Third option after that reconsideration is that they can issue a notice that they're withdrawing or modifying the guidance document or the rule. Now, what process they use may depend on the type of rule it is. If it's a guidance document, it's really easy to change. No formal process is, is necessary. And I submit that ver there's very few reasons to send most guidance documents up to Congress. I've seen some discussion in the press that it's ridiculous to say this applies to guidance documents. The most important um, reason it matters that they apply to guidance documents is that for the years that they've been thought to be in effect, they can't be. And that's, that's significant even in and of itself, regardless of what the administration does with the guidance document going forward. But I anticipate that with most guidance documents, the administration should take care of it themselves. With regard to notice and comment rules, there's an argument that the rulemaking was just never final. So the Supreme Court's um, and other courts' um, doctrine that says you need to go through notice and comment to repeal or modify a notice and comment rule might not apply. But the safer course, the more prudent course, would be for the administration to engage in an interim final rule process if it wants to modify or um, withdraw the rule and announce what its proposed modification and withdrawal is and seek comment on it. And they can seek comment on what the actual costs of illegal implementation were rather than just the projected costs. And of course, the final option uh, to the agencies after consultation uh, is to request that um, Congress actually disapprove it with a statement of administration policy that the president would sign the bill. That would obviously require coordination. I also submit, like any other legislative request, they should consult the House and Senate leaders to see if the House and Senate leaders would be receptive to disapproving that old regulation um, because they might want to take care of it themselves if that's not politically reasonable. I will say one thing about sending guidance documents, even though the, the administration can itself kill them, they probably should send a few, and we've identified a few good candidates on our website, redtaperollback.com, um, that would have, in part, one, one reason is that it'll af positively affect an ongoing rulemaking if Congress does disapprove it, or it will, and it will prevent an agency from ever issuing a substantially uh, similar rule again. Now, my, my concluding thoughts I don't have time for, but I'm just gonna, going to, um, uh, invite questions. Uh, we have intervened in a very uh, Pacific Legal Foundation. My colleagues and I have intervened in a um, humorous lawsuit by the um, CBD the, um, uh, versus Zinke to overturn one of the rules that were disapproved, um, claiming that Congress cannot pass a law to overrule a regulation unless it uses certain magic words and actually repeals the underlying statute. This is preposterous, but it turns the separation of powers on its head. We can discuss that uh, more. And also, Senator Cory Booker disagrees with David Vladek and has introduced the Scrap Act um, to overrule the CRA. He should talk to Harry Reid, who was a proud co-sponsor of the CRA and defended it in his farewell address to Congress last December. But it's very interesting that there are certain members of Congress who do not uh, who, who cannot stand their fellows taking accountability for the regulations that are passed. Thank you. I'll ask uh, two to four questions and then, and then open it up. Uh, David Vladek, let me step way back from the complexities of the CRA <clears throat> to a fundamental, a big fundamental point that I think Senator Lee touched on, uh, that always drifts in my mind when we're talking about subjects like this. Uh, he mentioned, you know, the gigantic size of the Code of Federal Regulations versus how few statutes there are. And he raised the question, well, is the world just too big and complicated now for Congress to pass all the laws that are needed to regulate what needs to be regulated is the country. And I think he suggested, no, it's not too big and complicated. We have our constitutional system and that's what we should stick to. Um, but in your view, could Cong I mean, if we just did away, uh, could we just do away with administrative agencies and have Congress do everything? And if not, uh, 
how does it fit together? You know, how, how does Congress police this gigantic lawmaking enterprise that's taking place under its auspices? Well, you know, it's interesting that my, my view of Congress is less dysp dystopian than Senator Lee's. Um, having been an executive branch official, in, in, I ran an independent agency, um, I've interacted with Congress uh, at least three or four times a week. Uh, there is, a, particularly a given the fact that Congress was in the hands of a different party, there was aggressive and appropriate oversight. Um, the committees that oversaw our agency knew what was going on. Um, but members of Congress are very busy. They have multiple responsibilities. They sit in multiple committees. Uh, I think it's unreasonable to expect them to be able to get into the minutia of what agencies do, much of which is very technical. If you actually read the Federal Register, and I do, I don't think I can claim to have read all 97,000 pages last year, but most of what agencies do is very technical work that is essential to protect Americans, their health, their safety, their pocketbooks. And so I think, you know, it's very cavalier to say, well, Congress can do it. The administrative state grew up in a bipartisan way because Congress was unable to essentially worry about the details of government. And frankly, that's not a good use of Congress's time. If you look at statutes, take the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. The FDA regulates a quarter of our economy. And you should be grateful that it exists and the experts at the Food and Drug Administration are doing their job. You don't have to worry that the food you eat is safe or the drugs that you take are unlikely to kill you and are more likely to treat your whatever illness you have. These are not, you know, Congress is, is, is just not, in my view, institutionally capable of worrying about some of the very technical issues that we have to deal with. You know, do you really want Congress figuring out the regulations for nuclear power plant safety? Uh, you know, the, the, these agencies were created by men and women of good faith for good reasons. And by and large, this administrative state has served us well. And so uh, the idea that Congress is, Congress is simply, you know, toothless, disengaged, uh, that's just not true. And, and Senator Lee, who's an aggressive, you know, energetic guy, uh, is exhibit A to that. Thank you very much. Todd, um, I'm looking at a Wall Street Journal uh, 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 editorial from Monday, I guess it was, about the methane rule canary. And just to give give a little context. It begins, Republicans in Congress have repealed 13 Obama administration regulations thanks to a potent tool known as the Congressional Review Act. And part one of my question is, 13 is the same number that the same Wall Street Journal editorial page gave on February 28th for how many regulations have been knocked off. And the question is, has anything happened since then? And is, are things slowing down as this editorial seems to worry? It says they didn't succeed in knocking off a, a very expensive methane on federal lands rule. Realistically, uh, how, do you still expect to see a lot of juice out of this Congressional Review Act in the foreseeable future? And could you uh, give two or three examples of regulations you would like to see uh, dispatched this way? Yeah, thank you, yeah, and, and it helped me to clarify that the, the, there are complicated periods that if they run out at one session, start over. Um, and the period has now expired on um, those rules that were actually submitted. And there were, there were thousands that were actually submitted to Congress. There were about 230 that were on a target list that Congress should consider disapproving. And the fact that they, by the way, they did, I think, pass a 14th, and I apologize for not knowing that, certainly, and, and the, other than the methane, and I'm not sure if that's awaiting the, the, the president's signature. So there may be one more before the, the period expired um, for those that were actually submitted. Um, but the fact that there were 230 of thousands submitted on a target list, um, and there were 15 attempts, uh, 14, I think, passed, I know 13 did, 
and that one failed disproves the silly argument that Congress just reflexively votes to disapprove any rule that's put before it. The 15 were chosen very carefully, um, and one of the calculations failed. McCain was an unexpected uh, no vote for the methane rule. Some, some have suggested that his motives may have been um, mixed, and I, I, don't, I have no idea. But, um, but that shows that Congress is thoughtful about the, the, the use of the Congressional Review Act. I wish they would have done more. But as for the rules that were never submitted, we do have uh, so far 12 examples, and we'll be loading a lot more on our website. But let me give you just one um, that we are litigating, the Alaska Supplement to the 1987 uh, Wetlands Manual um, declares that permafrost in Alaska is a navigable water of the United States. Now, I don't think it's navigable at all. If it is, it's probably a state navigable water. It's not a federal navigable water. Um, but we are litigating against it because it, was, it violated a, a 1992 and 93 statute that prohibited regional manuals. And what I told my colleagues is this, there's illegal for another reason. It was never submitted to Congress. But if it were submitted to Congress now, um, I hope that it would be significant enough and ridiculous enough for, for Congress to disapprove. But until it's submitted, um, uh, it, it is unlawfully uh, being enforced. Another one that's gotten some attention are the sage-grouse uh, records of decision. Um, that imposed extensive control over 70 million acres of, of federal land for a species that the Fish and Wildlife Service said is not endangered. There's actually hunting season for it in, in, in several of, of, of the states. And for, for the uh, uh, interior and agriculture to impose these kind of limits for a non-endangered species, uh, many members of Congress were upset about. But they were wrongly denied 15 months ago the right to use the Congressional Review. So if those rules are sent up to Congress, that would be, a, a, I think, a pretty good candidate uh, for, for disapproval. Thanks very much. Um, by the way, I'm curious, why are there thousands of rules that were never submitted as required by the Congressional Review Act? Was that an oversight? Were, I, there, were people afraid I always, something bad would happen? I, I always think that incompetence or, or neglect is the better example than, than conspiracy. But OM, GAO and CRS would constantly do these studies and they would find about one-seventh of those even in the Federal Register were, weren't being submitted. You'd think that he, at least the Federal Register, a Brookings study found 348 significant rules, and that's significant by economic standards, in the Federal Register alone are still subject um, to review. But if you include the guidance documents with the Brookings scholars did not include, um, I think there are at least hundreds and hundreds of significant rules, but that's um, one estimate by uh, 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 Nawab. He, he's an ACUS uh, staffer, but he wasn't working for ACUS when he wrote this report that's on our site. Suggested that, well, um, six out of seven rules were submitted. So, you know, maybe to the federal government, six out of seven ain't bad. Mm -hmm. But that left about a thousand rules a year that were not submitted. Right. Uh, one more for you, David. As a fellow who's, I suspect, kind of fond of some federal regulations, maybe not all of them, uh, do you think the Congressional Review Act is going to be a powerful engine of destruction of the kind of regulations you like, or do you think it's not going to be that big a deal? I think it is. I mean, I, I would not agree with Senator Booker. I had not realized he had uh, uh, proposed legislation that would undo all of Todd's hard work. That would be, that would be a shame. Um, I think the Congressional Review Act is, is, I mean, all it is is a procedural statute that routinizes a power Congress has anyway. So if, if Lisa Murkowski were really worried about the permafrost enforcement manual, and I wonder whether it's ever actually been used in an enforcement case, she could go to her colleagues and talk to the delegation from Alaska in the House. I, I just don't know why anyone would care all that much, though. You know, what's permafrost today may be a navigable water tomorrow, uh, the way things are going. Um, but, but Congress retains the authority to overturn regulations, in, wholly independent of the Congressional Review Act. 
So I think it's a useful tool because it does several things. It provides a process. As Todd points out, it eliminates the filibuster so you can actually get a vote. Um, and if Congress thinks that the, that the regulation ought to be set aside, the ergonomics regulation is the classic example. I thought it was a valuable regulation, but there were concerns about its cost, its implementation, and Congress overturned it. Yes, it was in a transition period, but it was a rule that people were worried about as it was being developed. I think that's Congress's, I think that is a power inherent in Congress, and I think the CRA simply provides a useful set of tools for Congress to exercise a power that it has under the Constitution. Thank you. I'm going to invite questions from the floor. I'm going to stand up. Uh, any questions from the floor? Please raise your hand high. Yes. Hi. Mr. Clements, you make the point about the new shot in rules. Scully makes the point that a house should stand as a house is built, knowing where every nail goes. The fact that the minutia is not known, the fact that you're using loosely terms like enforcement, Wall Street's a perfect example of how you've got enforcement and turns things over to U.S. attorneys who may not surprise where no one did the years ago document that I found the papers, but nobody said turn the crimes to criminals. So having dealt with legislators, when I provided the docs to Ed Royce, he was blown away and said no one told us. So this is an argument for you to consider and reconsider. Minutia, you need to know what's down here, the legislators need to know. They need to know that they have the authority to have the review of these agencies. And you're missing the word self-regulatory agency. Many of the agencies have created step away institutions to handle some of the lower ground work for Well, let me try to answer it this way. First, um, there's always a concern about Congress uh, overseeing a law enforcement investigation. And in fact, there's Supreme Court doctrine that suggests that it's inappropriate for Congress to intercede in a law enforcement investigation or in a prosecution. Um, so I, I'm not sure that the Madoff example is the one that I would use. In terms of knowing the details of agency rules, Congress has committees, and, the, large, and the, the major responsibility of committees is to carefully oversee the agencies that are subject to their jurisdiction. And so there are lots of members of Congress who know all of the details about most of the FDA rules, but that's, that's a small part of Congress. The idea that everyone in Congress um, somehow ought to understand the minutia, to, to use that word, uh, I think sort of undercuts the structural architecture that Congress has created to get its work done. Um, but there are often, every day, that Congress is in session, they're hearing so members of Congress can dig deep and find out why it is biosimilars, which are the new form of, of therapeutics, are regulated in the way they are. Um, the idea that guidance documents ought to be subjected to the CRA strikes me as uh, a serious problem because guidance documents simply express, and, and there's an Article II issue here, they simply express the executive branch tentative view of the law. Um, so, you know, I think that I, it's odd that, you know, Senator Lee is the one sort of suggesting that Congress is not doing its job. Um, in terms of oversight of agencies, I think Congress, by and large, is institutionally competent and does a pretty good job in doing that. I mean, I, every time I went, uh, you know, up before the Hill, it was like getting a very thorough medical exam, and I wasn't happy. <laughs> Decorum pro prohibits me from talking about what kind of exam, but... If, if I could just add 30, 30, 30 seconds. I think many guidance documents are very tentatively asserted, very tentatively very hard against many clients, including our clients in the uh, Tin Cup case in the Alaska that, that is subjected to the permafrost uh, rule, and it isn't actually very tentative. So, so guidance documents are used as a substitute for notice and comment rulemaking, and that's why Congress wanted to review it. 
But I think as David pointed out, today's permafrost is tomorrow's mud puddle, and tomorrow's mud puddle is, uh, is a raging torrent down the road over there. Uh, thank you, thank you, Stuart. Um, I just wanted to point out that, of course, it suddenly occurred to me that, that uh, permafrost in a regulatory sense is much the equivalent of Kurt Vonnegut's Ice Nine. And uh, for, for <laughs> anyone who goes back that far in their, uh, in their uh, popular reading. Uh, and, uh, and I think it, it, in some ways, descends from a case that hasn't been mentioned, but I think was, it, it was equally kind of a threshold in that area compared to Chevron, which is Riverside uh, Bayview Homes. Uh, in, in which I think that, uh, that Justice White, writing for the majority in 1985, uh, you know, made a mistake that I'm concerned as we go forward with Congress reviewing these, that there was an effort to do just what David suggested. When people thought that the agency was off track in defining navigable waters, then in fact that wasn't something that required expertise, that was something that just required in institutional aggrandizement that Congress made an attempt to roll that back uh, uh, legislatively. It was unsuccessful, and the justice held that against them. So I, 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 they, for that reason, I, I feel very worried about David's kind of dismissing the importance of whether or not some of these things fall under CRA because of all the power Congress theoretically has. Um, I, you know, and I guess that was not a question, but I'm guessing I'm wondering, David, if I've <laughs> if undercut there, your argument. If, there wasn't, if it wasn't a question, we won't call for an answer. We are about out of time, so one more, please, from over there. One thing that uh, Senator Lee did not touch on this morning was that of a regulatory budget, and I was curious if you had any thoughts on the bill that he introduced about a regulatory budget and who would be best suited to draft that, Congress or the executive within OMB? I think they, they both should work on it and they should work on it together, hopefully, if it's gonna pass. But I, 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 I'm not a, I, I'm enough of a non-expert amateur to know that it's very valuable and worked in other countries effectively. But um, in um, Clinton's uh, two for one, which I think is 13771 executive order, um, whether you think the two for one is a is a gimmick or not, there is, there are some budgeting requirements, um, and the um, OMB is going to set regulatory budgets for the agency. I think it's zero this year, which means there right, has zero. to be a cost neutrality to new rules um, paid for. It's sort of a pay for um, scheme um, with the the uh, withdrawal of other regulations. In the future, conceivably, the president could set, consistent with other laws, and that's the tricky part, consistent with other laws, could actually set a negative budget. Okay, your budget EPA for this year is negative $100 million, which means that if you want to issue new rules, or, and you're required to in some cases, you've got to eliminate a net $100 million worth of costs. So let me make two points. One is, the current executive order, which sets a, a regulatory budget of zero, is plainly unconstitutional. The president has no authority to, to purport to change statutes, many of which forbid the agency from worrying about costs and, except to the extent of feasibility, like the OSHA statute and many others. To the extent Congress wants to set a regulatory gen, uh, budget, the vexing problem, and Jim Tozzi's staring at me, so um, I want to make sure I get this right, is valuation. Um, how do you value a regulatory budget? And there have been prior discussions about regulatory budgets, and most of them have frayed and gone nowhere, largely because questions about valuation um, sort of swamp the ability of legislatures uh, to, to establish a sensible way of, of making a budget. And, uh, you know, it, uh, notwithstanding Jim's work and others, this is not, not anything approaching a science. Um, it may no longer be mysticism, but it's somewhere in this big chasm between science and just guesswork. And so I think a regulatory budget, until we have better tools to figure out costs and benefits, um, it would be uh, deeply ill-advised. Thank you. I'm afraid we're eight minutes over our budget, so we'd better stop. Thanks to the questions. Thanks to our panelists.